I'm glad to see that you're interested in, you know, learning more about doing um, virtual events. Um, we do have a few people that I'd like to introduce um, um, that are with us is my two co-hosts, uh, Gary Edwards. So if you'll say a couple words so that you can come on screen here. Yes, uh, welcome. I'm the vice president of Peachtree section, Gary Edwards, and in Peachtree, the vice president is responsible for coordinating events. So that's one, one reason I got into this. Right, okay. You, and, my, <laughs> and my other co-host is regional director, um, Doug Giganto. Doug, you around? Where's Doug? I have to unmute myself, sorry. Okay. Well, Doug, Doug uh, like I said, is the regional director. He's also going to um, be moderating uh, the chat questions for us during, during the meeting. Uh, we also have a couple other people. Um, uh, we have Jean Jurek with us, who's uh, a past national president and current DAL for, for NBCA. So welcome, Jean. Thank you. And Jim Roberts, uh, who is also a director at large. Um, I know, Jim, you're, you're with us here. I, I don't know if I see your video here, but, or your audio. Well, uh, I know Jim's with us. And also Rick, Rick Seifert, who's the Central Region Director. So, uh, Rick, welcome. Thank you, Diane. I appreciate it. Great. So, I don't know if I, hopefully I got everybody. Is there anybody else who's a DAL or a Regional Director that I might have missed? Yeah, okay. Yeah, if not, then we are going to get started here. Um, I'm going to share my screen here, and we're going to start. Okay. And Gary, if you could please take care of. Yeah, done. Done. <laughs> okay. Okay, so. I think we've probably covered this. This is the Peachtree section is is uh, presenting this um, and I've introduced our hosts. So here's going to be our agenda for today. So we've the welcome. Um, I'm going to go over some Zoom controls and rules of engagement. Some of you probably have seen some of this before if you've been on our, some of our other uh, teleconferencing. But I think it's particularly important for this session to go over that because I think that if when you start to um, do Zoom events and you have uh, new people on, it's probably good to go over some of these things, maybe not all of them. Um, but this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, Gary Edwards is going to start out with what you'll need to know to ho host a virtual Zoom event, you know, kind of the, the planning stuff. Then I'm going to come back and start talking about some more about the technical pieces of this, you know, how to set up your Zoom meeting, different things that you need, and how to manage, manage Zoom meetings and what to do after. Um, then we'll take a, a break, uh, maybe five minutes or so. And then I'm gonna do a, a live uh, demo and we're gonna talk about the setup and the settings that you wanna consider and where you're gonna find those. I'm actually gonna go out to the Zoom, Zoom site itself, show you how to schedule meetings, and then we'll talk about hosting and participant controls and some various things there. Um, then we'll end up our session with the Q&A. Um, I'm anticipating that this session will probably run about an hour and a half, no more absolutely than two hours. If we, if we get to be that long, then we need another meeting, okay? Okay. So I'm going to talk about where are where are my controls? Okay, so for those of you that are that are on a computer, okay, if you move your cur your cursor to the bottom of the screen, these controls are along the bottom. So you, here's your mute button here. So um, if we start to get a lot of background noise and everything, I'll mute everybody. Um, but if try to keep your um, your microphone muted. Um, the, here's your start and stop your video button. You don't need to worry about the security thing. Um, if you want to, uh, in, in the participant panel, there's something called, we'll talk about raising hands, okay? So when we are, when we get to the Q&A, um, if you wanna speak, you can raise your hand by clicking on the participant panel, and then over here is this little raise hand button, little blue hand will show up, and we'll, we'll practice that in the, in the practice session. 
Then there's also this chat window, and this is where we're going to ask you to chat your questions during the session, and uh, that's where Doug will moderate them, and he'll he'll you know he'll moderate them back to me, and I'll answer them as we go go through the session. The share screen right in this session will be will um, be limited to only the host, um, and we'll talk about why that is, why you probably want to have it set up that way, unless you're in really small meetings and stuff like that. There's also another little button down here called reactions, which is giving thumbs up um, or thumbs or uh, applause during the session. I don't see a lot of people doing that. Um, oh, I wanted to also note over here in the chat window, you can chat to everyone. So if you have a question, chat your, your question to everyone. But you know, if you wanna have a little sidebar with somebody else during the meeting, the, everybody's name will be listed in this dropdown uh, and you can chat with them, them privately. So that's a computer. This is where those controls will be if you're on a tablet or an iPad. Your, your, your screen's going to look like this. They're going to be in the upper right-hand corner of the tablet or screen, so you need to tap on that, and that's where you'll find the mute button, the video <coughs> button. But to find the chat and raise hand, you got to get over into these three little dots, okay, um, or your little thumbs up, thumbs down. So they kind of bury them over there. Okay, if you're on a smartphone, I don't know if any, I think you are, uh, Michelle's on a smartphone. Uh, these controls show up right at the bottom of your screen. However, during the meeting, you might find that these things will just slide away. We'll just tap, tap on your screen and these, these controls. Will I'm on a computer, back. Diana. I'm on oh, a okay. laptop. Okay, good. Well, sometimes you're on, a, you're on your phone. Yes. <laughs> So if they're they're here. So if you're on a on a smartphone, and then again, if you want to get to the chat or the raise hand, you got to get into these little little more buttons. Okay. Okay. I think here there are two different views in in um in Zoom, and one is a gallery view. When we first came in, you were probably in gallery view where you see all the little thumbnails. Um, but if you just want to see who who's speaking full screen, you can move to something that's called speaker view. And the, the, if you're on a computer, they're in the upper right hand corner, then they look like this. Gallery view is all the little thumbnails, speaker views is whoever's speaking. And that's why it's important to have people's microphones muted in the background because Zoom assumes that whoever, wherever it hears noise will throw that person's video onto the screen. So that, that can be annoying if you have a lot of that going on. If you're on an iPad or um, if these controls are in the upper left, okay, and there's little, here's the little um, gallery view or the speaker view. If you're on a smartphone, it's by swiping left or right to get between those two views. Okay. Now I think everybody's pretty much good here, um, but one thing that we've um, that we've experienced in in meetings is people come into the meeting and they're not they have they're called iPad three or extra computer or something. We actually I'm going to go ahead and tell your story, Gary. Okay, we were in a very large meeting uh, with George Murphy and we had somebody in the meeting called iPhoto XXXYYYY. Well, we thought it was somebody hacking in and we booted booted that person. Well, as it turned out, it really wasn't, it really was one of our members. And um, unfortunately, he didn't know how to do the mute, unmute, and you know, all those kind of controls and was, was continually breaking into the meeting. So if you need to rename on a computer, you can go to, um, you can go to the participant panel. This is one way that you can do it and go over here to more and hit rename. Um, you can also do that by your little thumbnail. There's also a little rename button there. If you're on a smartphone, again, it's a little more involved. You gotta go to participants, then tap on your name, hit rename, and then type your name for on smartphone and a tablet. Okay. Now, you, a lot of people ask about the virtual backgrounds, uh, and Gary's gonna do a nice job of talking about some setup about virtu you know, your, your setup in your, your office space or wherever you're gonna be doing it. But this is how you get to the virtual background. Next to the little, um, the little video here is, there's a little up arrow, arrow and it says choose virtual background. So there's some preloaded ones in here that come in Zoom. But if you want to load your own, like behind me, I have this bookcase. This bookcase is not my house, okay? <laughs> the bookcase is a virtual background. You hit the little plus sign and then go to your computer and grab a, um, a, a photo. 
And we'll, we'll talk about some of the things you want to watch out there about virtual backgrounds. If you're on a tablet or an iPad, you're back under these little three little dots up here, virtual background, over here, click, you know, select what you want, press the plus sign, and then you can select a photo out of your photos in your iPad. That's where the images come from, is from your photo library. And kind of same thing for the smartphone. It, on a smartphone, you got to get into the three little dots, pick your virtual background, and then hit the plus sign, and then hit from add photos, and then hit the little close window here. Okay. Okay. Okay, so a little bit of rules of engagement. This is something I, I strongly suggest that you set up for, for whatever your meeting is, is, you know, your rules of engagement may change based on your audience, you know, but there's some, there's some common ones here about muting, renaming them. Um, if they can activate, people can activate the video so others in the gallery can see them. I'm gonna ask you to please chat your questions during, while Gary's presenting or I'm presenting and Doug will moderate the uh, questions back to me. Um, you can also use the raise hand feature if you wish to speak, you know, and then we can call on you if, um, if it's appropriate at that point. And only presenters are, are currently locked or can share their screen. And, you know, let's try to, try to stay on topic if we're having a conversation, okay. Okay, I am going to turn this over to Gary to talk about what you're going to need to host a virtual Zoom meeting. Okay, how about coming out of screen share and just let, let me talk for a okay. few minutes? Okay. okay. Hold on, I'm not quite there. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Great. Well, a couple of things. You know, I think that uh, doing events by VTC kind of allows you a, a dimension of flexibility and in simplicity and accessibility and allows us to better reach out to our members. Um, however, I mean, it's not a magic wand. You still have to have what you need for any event, which is interesting content and a good presenter. But what it does give you is more flexibility. Now, I'm personally very reluctant to do a one hour or two hour event where, you know, many of our members in large geographic regions may have to drive two hours. I mean, I'm two and a half hours from Atlanta. You know, I'm probably not going to drive two and a half hours there, one hour event, two and a half hours back, five hours in the car for one hour event. I know Carolina region has that issue as well with a large geographic area. And I think a lot of our regions do, our sections do. But with Zoom, with the VTC, whether it's Zoom or some other platform, you can do a one hour event or a two hour event and not feel guilty about it and present a high quality event. And I think it's easier to do a high quality one hour event than it is to do a high quality all day event. So that type of flexibility I think is really beneficial. And the other thing that I really like about it is it opens it up to new or different presenters. Our first one of these was uh, after Diana had set up a uh, video teleconference board of directors meeting and I asked her, hey, can I do a tech session? And she said, well, of course. So we have, you know, we've been kind of trying to think of what we do when we're socially locked down. So I just put together a one-hour tech session on work I had done on uh, a 107 and uh, just did it with a peach-free section. We had about 25 people. It went really well. And I, I point that out because, you know, I'm not a professional mechanic. I would not normally schedule myself to do a peach-free tech session. But in you know, the format of the VTC, allowed me to kind of experiment in that direction. And so I think not only do you get the flexibility of doing a shorter event, but you can also open it up to different presenters without a level of risk. And the other thing I think I've learned from this is, I think that some events are better by VTC, you know, especially like tech sessions. You don't have people in the back not being able to hear, Everybody can see the demo or the display, especially if you have a specific camera on it, or what I like is pictures specifically on what you're trying to point out so you don't end up crowding around a car and the people in the back not being able to see. And, and the real revelation was kind of crowdsourcing answers. If you do questions with chat to everyone and you're in a large group 
And it's not one of the ones where we have, say, the National Technical Advisor, if it's uh, more like, you know, us MBCA members that work on their own cars and you have, say, 100 of us in the room, while the presenter is presenting, some other folks will probably be asking questions and chat to everybody, and someone else who's knowledgeable in the audience will be answering the question. And that doesn't distract anybody from listening to the presentation, but it also gets questions answered in a really efficient kind of crowdsourcing fashion that you really wouldn't be able to do in a room because you'd be whispering and other people wouldn't be able to hear. And so it, there's a, a couple dimensions that make it better for some type of events than actually being in person. Now, I would say it has transformed the way that we look at our events. We're, we're really evaluating all our events to see if they should have a virtual component. And for example, we were originally planning a, a photography seminar in June where we were going to do it in person only and then we were discussing doing it in person plus uh, a virtual VTC component and now we transitioned to total uh, virtual because of health concerns of the presenter uh, getting in a group in June and but we're looking at each event that way and seeing if we can reach out because if you have members that are in a high-risk group now or you just have members that are a long distance away, it allows you to reach out to those members that otherwise wouldn't be able to take part in your activities. And being concerned about membership now, I think that's a really uh, important concern. And the final overall point I want to make is that a, a video teleconference event is really kind of easier to set up than the traditional events in person that we've been doing especially when you have a technical wizard like Diana to help you set it up. But uh, yeah, the, the most challenging thing is very often setting up lunches or dinners for large groups and you're not having to do that. And you're not having to pay for speaker travel and you're not having the time to walking from one place to another or where you're gonna park the cars. There's relatively minimal costs for the VTC events. So you have low financial risk, which again, go back to allowing you to experiment some with different formats of events. So, I mean, that's kind of overall the way I look at these events after having done a few of them. And I personally enjoy hosting them. I enjoy setting them up. And uh, you know, it's just really a lot of fun, especially if you're uh, socially distancing and you're not able to talk cars like you normally prefer to do. Now, Diana, could you go back to screen share on the slide? I'll cover some of the slide points. Sure. And one of the things that gets a little awkward is when one person's presenting the slides and the other person's talking towards them. But uh, I'll mention under speaker, not only do you need speakers to, that can present interesting topics, but you're, the speaker really needs to have a camera. Uh, we've done a presentation where the speaker had good, good uh, interesting things to say and some good pictures to illustrate, but no camera. And so when when there weren't pictures being screen shared, all we saw was a black screen with their name on it. And this just really isn't the same as to have a, uh, the image of a live person in front of you. I'll get down to the, uh, you know, the computer piece. You know, some of the things that, that I do, you know, I use a computer, I've got a couple of monitors, yeah, but I've learned I, I restart my router in my computer beforehand basically the night before to make sure there's that it's fresh but also to give me time to recover if there's a problem i also i've actually got two mice hooked up so that if my primary mouse dies i've got the second one and i since i've got a wi-fi mouse for one of them i make sure the batteries are new or i change the batteries um, i've actually got two internet adapters on my computer one is wired one is wi-fi we've actually done some tests uh, what happens if you lose internet? If you unplug one of mine, the other, the Wi-Fi one keeps it going. So it's very handy to have those backups, especially if you're the host or the presenter. The other thing I'd say about the computer is since it's pretty much tied to your camera most of the time is look at your camera angle if you're going to be a host or a presenter. Uh, a lot of the times if you're just sitting the thing on the table in front of you, it, it gives you a view like, like 
they're looking up your nose. And you know, if you're the host, they don't really want everybody kind of looking like they're looking up your nose. Uh, and also, uh, get, getting the lighting right is important. Um, you know, not so much if you're a participant, but if you're, a, if you're hosting, you know, a window behind you will backlight you and you'll be invisible. And so you really need to avoid that. Uh, if you can't see what I've got in front of me, but I've got two lights, one on each side of me, and a virtual background. Uh, Diana, could you come out of the slide? Let me sh let me just talk virtual background for a minute. Let me change my virtual background here. Okay, I'm going to go to a different virtual background just to make a point. Okay, now what you don't you don't usually see me doing a hosting a presentation with a virtual background like that because half of you are now looking to figure out what kind of car that is and the other half are scoring it as if we were in a concourse. And so what I've selected for my virtual background, the one that you typically see me using is, um, you know, this one. And I chose that one because it gives a kind of a sense of place. I'm in rural Lincoln County, Georgia and but that's actually the other side of the house. That's the view at my wife's office, not, not mine. But it's also, I shot that specifically to be a virtual background for this, to be not distracting. There's no one thing in the background that you're going to, you know, like, like uh, try to score in concours. When I first shot that, there was actually a bird in the, in the picture, too, and I cropped that out so you all wouldn't be focusing on that. You could just focus on me. And you have to work on your colors. The, what I've got, let me take down the virtual background and show you what, what's really here. Let's see, how do you turn that off anyway? Just go to <laughs> none. Go yeah. to none. <laughs> okay, so this is really what I'm sitting in. I've got a uh, green screen with a... Uh, a blue screen. Yeah, it's kind of a blue-green uh, set. I've actually got a, a, a matching sheet on the back of my chair here, so you can't see the chair either. And there's a window here with the uh, blinds closed and a window over there with the uh, blinds open and two lights up here. So I don't really have a lot of shadow on my faces. And the camera is at face level, not looking down, not looking up. If you want to work out your, uh, your virtual background, it turns out you can actually just log into Zoom and do your own little BTC, a host BTC all by yourself and it allows you to play with everything you want to with the background. And I did that, and then Joe and I did a BTC to kind of work out virtual backgrounds to make to see what would work best. You still have to be careful with it. Uh, this today, um, my, I was wearing a name tag, and you can see right through the name tag to the virtual background. Thursday when we did this, this coffee cup was invisible. Today it's not invisible. But so you have to be kind of careful. I, you always see me wearing a red shirt because that works okay with the virtual background. I tried this morning with a yellow shirt and my mustache and beard were just dis disappearing. And so, you know, you don't really want that. It's a little distracting. Okay, enough on virtual backgrounds. If you could take us back to the slide, and I'll, ju I'll just finish up quickly here. Um, I, you know, I live rural, but I've got uh, fiber optic uh, cable to the house and I've got 25 uh, megabits up and three down. Y'all that are more urban, probably have uh, better service than that, but it's that's been perfectly acceptable for multiple video streams. And just mentioning something on one of the other slides, if you're going to host one of these events, if you're going to be the registrar, you've got to make time every day to look at your email and see the questions that come up and answer the questions. The folks that are registering, some of them will have questions about uh, the event. Others will have uh, difficulty with registration for some reason. So you want between one and five percent of the people will have some type of, of uh, question that you'll need to respond to and you need to at least uh, spend some time every day on that. I do it a, a number of times a day. And the other thing I adjust when I'm hosting an event, I don't normally answer my phone unless it's a number in my contact list, but when I'm doing registration for an event, I answer the phone no matter what, because uh, you get a fair amount of calls of people asking, and, and those phone calls ought to be answered. 
Okay, so that's kind of what I was going to talk about. So I'll give that back to you, Diana. To Great. Go well, on. thank you, thank you, Gary. So, is there, before we go on, is there is there any questions? That, Doug, do we have any questions? Uh, I have one. I'm, <clears throat> it was from an attendee who wants to know how they put a fake face on the screen. <laughs> well, a fake face on the screen. We'll talk about. You can put a profile. You can have a profile picture in your uh, Zoom account, and you can put whatever picture you want in there. So, um, actually, we'll when we get to the demo part, we'll have a little example of that where I have a profile picture and Doug doesn't, and we'll show you the difference between that. So, but but that's a good point. If you're going to be doing board meetings. Um, and if you're voting in a board meeting, everybody should be on camera. And if you're saying yay or nay, you should be validating that everybody who's saying yay and nay is really who they are. So they should be on camera. Okay. Okay. And you're meaning live, not just a profile picture. Yeah, really. Yeah, not just a profile picture to have them meaning that their that their camera, their camera is on, right? So that you really know that who it is, right? So I think that's what the question is: is that uh, they may, maybe not want to project themselves, but have another image in their place. Well, and they can do that through a profile picture. So, um, but like I said, I'm just a word of caution in a in a board meeting that that's that should not be acceptable that they need to have their video camera on to prove that they are who they are. Okay. 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 Well, now I'm going to start talking about what, what you're going to need to actually, you know, if you're going to use zoom and quite frankly, you know what, I'm, I'm not necessarily married to this platform, but we are going to be talking about that technology here in this session because, and, and I'll tell you why I think, think that. Okay. But if you if your if your session if you have access to other other tools such as WebEx, GoToMeeting, Microsoft Teams, or whatever, you know, go for it. I mean, the principles of what Gary just talked about apply to all of those platforms. Uh, all the controls and things like that may be a little bit different um, in in those platforms, and you'll have to understand you know the nuances of that. But as far as Zoom is concerned, um, there are multiple kinds of plans. Um, there's this free plan. Um, so all of you can have a Zoom plan out there. The, and you can set up meetings and you can play with your virtual background, do whatever you want. The only, the only thing about free plans is, is that meetings are limited to 40 minutes or less. However, if, you're, if you do just wanna stay on a free plan, I wouldn't suggest that for a meeting for the club, um, you know, where you're having participants, um, you can immediately schedule another meeting right after that 40 minute one expires. Now, you probably have also heard out there in the marketplace that Zoom has been suspending that 40 minute limit. Well, that's kind of true, but kind of not true. Um, the true part is if you have an educational free plan, then they have, they have, um, they're not enforcing the 40 minutes, but at some point that 40 minutes is going to be uh, enforced. And you can have a maximum of 100 participants. Um, there have also heard little rumors, I've not proved it, um, that you can probably go over the 100 by maybe, maybe 10 or 20 percent and they won't, you know, they're not kicking people out. Now what we have is we have something called the pro plan. Um, it's $14.99 a month and it really is billed monthly. Or if you want to save a few bucks, you can go to the annual plan at $12.99. Um, there's no limit to the amount of time. Um, a meeting can literally be 24 hours. Well, I guess the, tw the limit is 24 hours. After 24 hours, the meeting will go, will go away. But if you're on that long, you are probably on too long. Again, there's a maximum of 100 participants in, in, that, in that plan. However, that there is this thing called the large meeting add-on. So I think a lot of you know that we have hosted uh, George Murphy where we had 250 people on, on the Zoom meeting with us. Um, so that additional little add-on is $50 a month. So we've added it on as we've needed it. So the only thing you have to watch out for is make sure that you cancel it uh, otherwise, it's on a recurring, you know, automatic schedule and we'll, we'll, we'll bill. And 
God help you if you need to try to get a hold of Zoom right now to, to deal with any kind of billing issues or anything like that. Um, there's also another format that I'll just mention here, and that's a webinar format. Uh, you've probably been on some of those. Webinars are more one way. So that means that what participants you can project to them, they can chat questions, but they, they don't have any ability to um, unmute themselves and, and talk with you. So, you know, that's just a matter of format on, you know, you know, based on your meeting, how, if that might be applicable, you could add it on if you wish, and it is an add-on that is available. You're also going to need some kind of possibly an email program, either a constant contact or MailChimp, possibly, depending on this point, and that's the registration system. We've been using Motorsports registration for all of our events at Peachtree for probably 10 years now. Okay, that's, so that's our preferred method, but that's not the only method. You can choose whatever method you want. If you're a small section and you just want people to email you and say, you know, sign up by email, well, that's fine. Your own personal email can work for, you know, small groups, you know, 30 to 50 people. Most, most email programs will allow you to mail to, to a, a list of that size. Zoom also provides an ability to have participants to register, okay? Um, I've used it, seems to work fine. It doesn't, it, it doesn't have any email capability with it other than you can export the participant list out and then you know, bring them into say Constant Contact or MailChimp or whatever mail program that you might have um, available to you, eye contact, et cetera. We also use, utilize a Google account, um, and I've been using that um, for post-event surveys called Google Forms. Um, if you want to want to use that survey mechanism, I'd be happy to talk with you, you know, after this meeting or offline on on how to set up uh, Google Forms. But I've been pretty happy with them. We've also been, been sharing these on our uh, YouTube channel. So we set up a YouTube channel, um, you know, clearly optional, you know, if you want to go down that path, you know, you probably need to have somebody who's got a little bit of video editing skills to get them prepared and get them loaded up there. Okay. Okay, any questions about just basic things that you kind of need? No, okay, go on. Okay, so the setup of your Zoom event, you're going to, you know, obviously create your plan, okay? Um, at least for Peachtree, what we did is we have a generic Gmail email account, okay, that we use for a lot of these things, like, um, like for Constant Contact, for, for the Zoom platform. So we have one login with, a, with passwords that we just share with a limited number of people, okay? Um, Zoom help you're going to find is very helpful um, and when I do my demo I'll show you how to access that Zoom help. Also there are YouTube videos out of the wazoo out there, okay. Um, we'll share some with you that we've shot personally that'll be a little more, you know, us, you know, that you know, but there are a, a zillion of them out there. You're going to need to download the Zoom app onto your computer. You've obviously all done that because you're in this meeting. These are typical things that you just need to do to, you know, get your event going. You know, you need to publicize your event, you know, your newsletter, website, email blast, Facebook, whatever, whatever communication mechanisms, you know, you use to, you know, get your events out to your, your intended audience, use that. This here, I think, is a real key thing. When you're, when you're getting ready to actually do, before your event, especially with a speaker that you haven't worked with before or may not be familiar that much with Zoom, a few days before your event, set up a practice Zoom meeting with that speaker. Make sure that they know how to share their screen. Make sure that, you know, that that speaker is comfortable. You know, make sure the speaker has visuals and has a camera, you know, and if you're trading off between people, understand, you know, what the agenda looks like and, and who's doing what, okay? We've already talked about picking, picking, you know, and setting up your virtual background. That just keeps, you know, I think the noise out of the, out of, out of, out of there. So, like you said, you know, you're not looking at cars and trying to figure it out, or you know, looking at somebody's house. You know, what's that picture, etc. Also, arrange to have a co-host in the Zoom meeting with you. Another person who'll be 
and or another person that's responsible for, for recording the meeting. I actually recommend at least a couple of co-hosts because if the main host gets kicked out or something like that, you wanna have somebody else that's in charge. Not only that, you wanna have the co-host to be monitoring muting people's microphones, um, monitoring the, the chat window like we're doing here. So it just really helps the presenter not to have to worry about that. Because you really, like right now I'm in full screen share. I cannot even see the participant panel or the, the chat window at this point. Hey Diana, this is Gary. Just to, to re-emphasize on having co-hosts, when she says if the host gets kicked out, if there's only one host and the host gets kicked out, the VTC drops and you're all out. And well, so, I've seen that not to be 100% true. I've seen it where it seems to assign the next person in, but I would not be comfortable with that, to be to be honest with you. <laughs> to uh, make Because sure we've, we've dropped ourselves that way. <laughs> yeah, we have dropped ourselves that way. We had actually gotten kicked out one time where actually that, maybe I should bring this up right here. We have the centralized Zoom account and and I think somebody, I think, went in and started the meeting again from that Zoom, from there, and that actually like disrupted the the meeting because one of the rules is you can only have at least with a pro plan, you can only have one meeting going in at any one particular time frame. So, so that can I think we we worked through that. Okay. So, Let's, let's understand and manage Zoom security. Every, you will get emails from people that says, Zoom is not secure, okay? Zoom has had some issues in, in the past. They've acknowledged them. They have fixed a lot of the things, but life is not 100%, okay? We, we can't guarantee anything, but there are some things that we can do in this Zoom environment to make your Zoom meetings more secure. Require that all your Zoom meetings require a password. There's a little checkbox. Suggest that you leave that checkbox checked, okay? That you, that you require that password. And that the link will be, when you, when you check that checkbox, you'll notice that that Zoom link, when I send it out, it's got a bunch of junk at the end. That's all of the password and it's you know all encrypted and everything. So that just kind of keeps people from, from possibly randomly generating a meeting ID and being able to get into a meeting. And that's, what, that's kind of what was going on early on with the Zoom bombers. They were randomly generating meeting IDs, going in, just really being a nuisance more than anything. They didn't really cause any, any harm. Um, okay, we've talked about that. Meeting participants will be placed into a waiting room before being allowed into the meeting. And we'll show you um, later on in the demo how that will look when they come in. And you just, it's very simple. You just hit the admit button. Um, but when you have a really, really large meeting like these big George Murphy things, when you've got 250 people joining all at once, there's no way for you to really sit down with a list and check people off. So you're just gonna hit admit all, admit all. So. That can that could still be a little bit risky, but today we haven't really had any problems other than that one that we talked about earlier. And it must be the co-host a host or co must must admit people into the meeting. They they will just sit there and if so if nobody if nobody logs in as the host, then they are going to sit there in the meeting. So it is really important if you're going to use this password thing that you make sure that the host shows up. There is another way, there is something called a meeting key that I can show you in the settings that you can give people that says when they log in without the host, that they could key in that key, that key and be able to get into the meeting and become the host. That's, that's another little backdoor thing. Okay. Now let's talk about... Um, Diane. Yeah. May I interrupt for a minute? Well, you um, are. You spoke about the email blasts and the announcement. Uh, and, and a big thing we do to provide security is the last minute announcement of the actual meeting ID and password. So well, let's, just go over, let's just go over for a minute. You know, in the announcement of, the, of an event, we tell people what we're going to do. And then we ask them to register on MSR so that they register. We check their email through that process. 
And then the evening before the event, we actually send out the Zoom ID and password. Well, that's not actually, we've actually changed our process a little bit, Joe. That we're, we're actually, we're, we're actually sending it out through MSR at the time of registration. So, because it's got to be, we do also do a reminder and we send it out again, but we've also been sending it out at registration time. Yeah, basically it turned out for the last event where we had 307 persons registered that it uh, got pretty hectic Friday afternoon with the, oh, I didn't get the meeting link. And right. so we decided for the next event to use the confirmation email in Motorsports. Motorsport to allow us to send that out. We'll see how well that works. <laughs> yeah, that we introduces might. security vulnerability. Yeah, we we may we may pull that back to exactly what you talked about, Joe. But we but we did have some a few challenges. So, but that is one thing is to consider holding that back until twenty four hours. Um, okay, there is some one time setup things. These are these are things in the Zoom settings that you're going to. I'm going to show you where to find them and where where to where to turn these settings up. <laughs> Probably the most important one. Um, yeah, can we? please mute microphones, um, is to turn the file transfer. There is, this is now a, the default used to be, this used to be on. I see now that it is now off. This is probably, probably the riskiest thing I think I see in Zoom, is if you had file transfer turned on, somebody, if they did hack in, and if they could transfer files, then they could transfer something onto your computer. So just make sure that this setting is turned off. You are going to want to turn on the co-host. If you don't turn on co-host in your settings, then you're not going to be able to assign co-host. And I already told you why you want to have co-hosts. You want to turn on a setting that's called play sounds when participants join or leave so that you hear a chime. The only people who need to see that is the host. I find that to be really helpful. So when somebody joins late, I get this little chime in my uh, ears and everything. A lot of times I wear headphones um, to reduce any kind of feedback, so it's kind of nice that I hear that I hear that chime. If you want to use polling, polling is questions in the meeting. That's available as a feature in Zoom, but you have to turn this feature on. It, by default, it is off. This is another one I think you want to you want to probably subscribe to is screen sharing to only allow hosts and co-hosts to screen share. Now the good news is, is that during your meeting, so like if you're in a board meeting and you want somebody else to share their screen, you can dynamically during the meeting override that and be able to allow other people to share their screen in, in, in the meeting. But just as by default, I have it set off, that way I don't have to think about it, and then if somebody else wants to screen share, then I make the conscious decision to screen share. Again, this is one of those Zoom bombing things. You know what, if they can't share their screen, and even if they get in your meeting, I guess they could turn on their microphone, they could make noise, but you could boot them out, um, but they won't be able to share any, you know, graphic um, pornography or anything on, onto, into your meeting. Okay. okay, well, this is probably, I'm talking about becoming familiar with Zoom controls. Well, that's why you're here today is to understand them a little bit more. You want to schedule your, your Zoom meeting. You can do it from the Zoom app, or you can do it from the web browser app and everything. For a meeting, uh, for large meetings, and you probably noticed when you came into this meeting, I set the participants' audio and video off. And the reason that I do that, at least for these, is anytime we're recording meetings, I turn them off. Even though we tell everybody we're recording, that I want to make, if you turned on your audio or your video, you made a conscious decision to do that. So if somebody chose in the meeting, did not want to be videotaped or didn't want to be heard, they can leave those things off. Um, and by default, that's the way it works. Now, coming into a board meeting, maybe that's, you can, might want to set them so a little bit differently than that. If you want to do any polls, you can you can do those do those ahead of time, or you can do them in the meeting. I think they're best set up ahead of time. Okay. Um, okay, we're talking about this meeting ID, sending it out 
this is just kind of a recommendation that what a, as kind of a procedure, 24 hours before the meeting, I send out an email with all of the information. You got it. I kind of have a pre-described little thing that I happen to like about what to tell people to do, um, et cetera. Um, but we're using MSR, Motorsports Reg, and we use the email blaster. We started using that. First couple meetings we, we did is I brought all of the all the participants into the constant contact. I found that to be kind of a, a pain because then I had to clean up our constant contact with people that really weren't a part of our, our, our section. But if you are using your personal email, if you are sending out a large list, say 30 people, use blind copy. That's a great way to get people's email addresses hijacked by not using blind copy, by just putting it in the two or the CC. So that's just a good recommended practice. Um, and Zoom registrations, if you use the Zoom thing, you can either have them auto approve or if you don't want them auto approve, then, you know, approve them 24 hours in advance to send them the meeting link. Um, I then you noticed this morning, I sent you another little reminder about four to eight hours in advance of the, the event, because if somebody is, you know, registered a week or two weeks ago, or maybe even the day before, we all get a lot of email that that Zoom link gets buried in their email and they can't find it if they haven't picked it up and put it on their calendar somewhere. Okay. Now, we've been doing post-event surveys, so that's something that, you know, if you want to do that, that's completely up to you. Here's an example of the email that I send out, you know, so just, just a quick, quick thing that, you know, you can saw it today when, or yesterday when I sent it out, um, I actually have another little link to a document that's got my little Zoom tips that I've, um, I've developed and everything to help the participants. Okay. And then the reminder, notice the reminder is just much shorter, you know, just basic, you know, hey, log in, here's, here, here's, here's the nitty gritty of it. Okay. Okay. So let's say, okay, let's talk about managing your Zoom meeting. So, okay, the day has come and it's time for you to actually do it. I suggest you log into your meeting at least, at least 15 minutes before the scheduled time to allow those that have never used Zoom to work on any technical things. You know, can't get the camera going, they can't get their microphone, et cetera. Um, give your assistants, you know, your co-host permission. You'll have to do that when you go into the meeting. Um, there is a way to set them up ahead of time, but we don't have a plan that really allows us to do that. Um, give recording privileges to another person if they're not, you, this is an option. So sometimes Joe's son, Scott, joins us and he's our video guy. And so I can just give him recording privilege without making him a co-host, okay? And that allows him to record and just get the recording onto his computer. Um, I don't have to worry about sending a, a, a giant file to him when he's on the meeting. Okay. You know, you want to check to make sure that your hope your 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 only the host can share your screen. Just double check those settings. Um, decide how and if participants can chat and set the control. Here's the way, here's the, the options for you for setting chat. You can you can shut down chat completely. No one can do it. You can say host only. We found host only wasn't a great thing because if you've got two or three co-hosts, then people get a choice of which host to send their, their, um, their chat to. So we were in a meeting and I was getting stuff and Gary was getting stuff, but we weren't both seeing it. Don't necessarily recommend that option when you've got co-hosts. <laughs> This is probably the best, the, the best ones are just everyone publicly and privately, people can go ahead and, and, and chat privately. And if you do set it to host only, people can still chat privately. I don't know why it doesn't say host only and privately, but it doesn't in, in, in Zoom. Okay. okay, any questions that we got here at this point, Doug? No? Okay. Okay, so, you know, admit your participants in from the waiting room when they get, you know, when the meeting begins, you know, either mute all your participants. There's a button that you can just mute everybody. You guys all did really good. You, you were all muted. Start the recording if you want to record. 
And if you, if you do have newbies, you know, I suggest going over these Zoom controls, okay? I will give you all of these slides and, and everything. You're welcome to use them as you, as you see fit. So, you know, go over some, some basic things with them. Particularly if you want them to raise their hand, show them where that control is, because it's kind of buried under that participant, in the participant panel. Okay. Okay, talked about those things. Okay, lastly, enjoy your event. Manage questions if you, in chat if you, if you choose. If you're using chat, you may want to save the chat, okay? And you can just, in your settings, you can, you can set that to always save. So when, if you're the host, when you exit out of the meeting, the chat gets saved onto your computer in a folder called Zoom. And there's a little text file there that's got, that's got the chat. Um, or if you don't have that set on, then you need to go to the little chat window and you need to say save, save the chat so that it, it does get saved. So we found, I think the one, one meeting we did with the um, 107, 129, there was a lot of, I think as Gary was saying, a lot of kind of crowdsourcing back and forth. People were asking questions, people were answering questions and participants wanted to, to see that afterwards. Okay, and then thank your participants for joining and then obviously in the meeting. Okay, what to do after your Zoom meeting is, is over. You know, I like to thank all my participants for, for, for attending. You know, whatever your, your communication me mechanism of choice is, you know, MSR, constant contact. Send out a survey if you wanna do that. Follow up with any documents or items requested. You know, have the recording process and post it on YouTube or wherever else you wanna post it. Um, email them a link to the recording if it was done afterwards and review survey results. And I have two questions. Okay. One is, can participants change their username while in the waiting room? That is a great question. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I know you can while you're in the BTC. Yeah, you know, I know you can when you're in the, yeah, you, when you're in there. If you go to the participant panel, and, or if you're on a computer in your little window, uh, there's three little dots you could rename yourself. I don't know about that. I'd have to research that. <laughs> All right, and the other question is, how do you boot a participant? Oh, that one I know, okay. How you, re how you boot the participant is we, um, we'll show you um, in the demo um, what the participant panel looks like when you are a host and there is the little more option. Um, it will say remove. There's actually two things you can do, okay? One is remove them from the meeting and if you remove somebody from the meeting, they cannot re-enter. If they're really being bad, you can, you can actually report them to Zoom and say report. So now you are reporting that user to, to Zoom as being a, a bad guy. What you looking at there, Doug? Uh, I was just looking here to see, well, first of all, I was checking to see if there's somebody in the, in the waiting room, if we could test that. The only way I could do that was for me to log out and come back in, and then you can take a look at it. You want me to do that? Yeah, well, we could do that while we take maybe a, you know, okay. a, a five minute. Why don't we take a five minute break and come back at two o'clock? When you're in the waiting room, you have a white screen. You can't do anything until the host admits you. Right. That's what I thought. I think the only thing you can do is test your audio controls. That's the correct. Only thing. And yeah. you can also check your video. Right. That's all. Right. That's all.